This is Amrita Verma for the World Art TV and I am right now with Geeta Singh and she is the director of Art Pilgrim in Gurgaon. Hi Geeta. Hi Amrita. I mean the monsoons are right here and it's uh, you know fresh everywhere you can see greenery all over and you've got a great show and it's called the monsoon number. Yes, we we decided that it would be a nice thing to have from the, after the heat of uh, the daily weather. Uh, I think the great part about this show from whatever I've seen is basically the fact that it's actually lending a certain freshness in uh, the way uh, curation has also happened. So uh, I believe uh, Sunit has curated the show for you? Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to take everyone through the show now and <laughs> uh, let's see what they think about it. <laughs> okay. Please do that. I'm now with Sunit Chopra, a very well-respected uh, personality within the art industry and Sunit has actually curated the show with a lot of care. I mean, uh, you know, from every little detail within each work, there is something which is, uh, which I've not seen in a lot of shows which have been curated before. So Sunit, can you take us a bit through the show, please? Yeah, this is uh, Gita and my joint effort. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> yeah. And you see, uh, we were lucky mm. to be able to have a perspective mm. and then fill up the gaps. And in this, you will see artists who are part of the progressive artist group of the uh, late 40s, early 50s, and how they continue to interest us in that work. And you can see there is Souza, there is uh, Akbar Padamsi, then there are artists like Suhas, right. and uh, you will find uh, the artists of the 60s and 70s. There is Biman Das, yes. the sculptor. There is uh, um, Cheshri Chakravarti. There is uh, uh, Yusuf Arakal, Neeraj Goswami, uh, Chandra Bhattacharya. So you can see there is a continuity of excellence of execution. I am very strict on one thing because I find a lot of people are selling gimmicks rather than art. This exhibition wants to re-establish the excellence of Indian art also as a craft. That is to say that these artists know what they are doing, they know their medium, they know the variations possible in the medium and they execute the work themselves and not use uh, craftsmen to do the job. Yes. So these are artists who actually do their work. That's one thing. The other thing is that these are also artists who because they work with material know how to think with material. And you can see that a number of these paintings are almost monochromatic. But the thought is so deep that, you know, you don't miss the fact that there are not many colors. I mean, you have some superb works like Chandra Bhattacharya's work there, which explains present day India in every sense of the word. You have that electric wire on top, and you have this man, a, a part of a face, and then you have that mark of, uh, you know, palm spittle on the wall as stain. All that is integrated into a first class work of art. You don't need to play holy with colors to, to be able to get. And here also you can see faces are cut at a certain point, which only an artist can do who is thoughtful. He knows exactly what to put in and what to keep out. And on the other hand, you have works like this, Souza. This is a very unusual Souza. Very unusual Souza. And you find that, uh, you know, it is erotic without being uh, in any way pornographic. Mm. So you can see that these are thoughtful artists. And this thought translates itself into good monochromatic art, good 
colorful art as you can see in the works of uh, gorjala and vaikuntham mm -hmm. it is colorful art taken from a tribal art mm -hmm. but it is not tribal art it is modern yes. they only use the colors yeah. gorjala for example is using uh, kalamkari techniques mm -hmm. but the figuration is iconic which is totally different it's modern yes. and in the same way you find that uh, arakal is using multiple images mm. in the same modernist framework yes. so you can see that these are artists who think in different ways they think in form they think in color and they also think in the non figurative sphere indian abstraction is not like man ray certainly not it is non figurative drawn from the images of the real world and often communicates a message of that real world as uh, pushkale has done in his thing on the phases of the moon but it's not only the phases of the moon you see a figure lying prone, prone on the ground so what he's trying to explain to you is that man also develops like the phases of the moon the moon rises and falls man also rises and falls and rises again so in that sense we wanted to bring out the wealth of indian art both art and sculpture and you will see here for example in the works of dalanjay singh the way he has handled steel is incredible let's go to that yes i think it's a beautiful work yeah you can see here the way he has handled steel is incredible he has made one of the hardest metals into one of the most malleable entities very and very fluid mm -hmm. and not only that you find that he has given it a deep life in a mythical uh, system where the kalpa vriksh the tree mm. the close connection between the human being and the tree all that is a part of our myths and legends and now when you look at his work it's not the myth that strikes you first if the myth strikes you first then the artist hasn't done his job mm. it's the aesthetic beauty of the work that strikes you first and then you move to the myth yes. and it's the same with radha krishnan yes. whose work if you like Uh, goes back to Ram Kinkar Bej, and also it goes back to the kind of figurine mm. in Mohenjo-daro that you get of the dancing girl, and you can see here that our sculpture goes from a deep culture which is internalized by the work and not obvious in it. So. Indian art today has 5000 years of culture behind it but because we've got 5000 years of culture behind it we don't have to show it off yes. <laughs> what we show is our expertise with that raw material and this exhibition shows you the expertise of each individual artist with the raw material of 5000 years Now I'm in front of Dharmendra Rathore's work, and Sunit has something very interesting to tell us about this. You can see very clearly that the new digital world enters into our artists' conceptions as merely a style. The work is executed with the finesse of any Indian art. and this work of dharmendra rathor shows you that you don't necessarily need a machine to accomplish similar high quality work and you can see here the figurative the non figurative blend together and you can see the sequence from nature to the city to the human being because the human being is imbibing both uh the rural background of india as well as the city and ultimately you know evolving as a being 
So this element you see in this work, which is very Indian again, because it's only India where we have 35% of the population that are farmers. In much of America, there are only 3% farmers, and the rest have to live in the big apple or whatever they call it. <laughs> But you know, this raises one question. Uh, as far as uh, Indian artists and their works are concerned, uh, do you see a certain problematic quality which is happening right now, which they need to address? See, the thing is quite simple. It is a problem only for somebody who is trying to put on something. I mean, if I'm wearing a mask, then I have a problem. If there is no mask, the odd wrinkle won't hurt me. So I, when I look at the works of Indian art, and especially the ones we have chosen here, there are works which may have an odd wrinkle, but they are real to the bone. Whereas in much of the gimmickry one sees in art today, there are masks and the moment somebody reads an international art magazine, the mask breaks. So, I mean, the process of internalization for an artist is actually essential for the work to have some kind of light. You see, you must internalize, because if you don't internalize, then you're like somebody who has indigestion, and your art also will be like the results of indigestion in a human being. Uh, I'm in, actually I'm in front of Satish Chandra's work and he's uh, done this wonderful landscape. You know, landscape in contemporary art in India is something a lot of people shy away from, but it is uh, something which has been a part of art traditionally. So uh, what do you have to say about it? You see, this is an Indian landscape. If you look at the colors, Satish used to paint the landscape of central UP, that is Lucknow and the areas round about. And you can see very clearly from the colors, these are colors that are deeply entrenched in us. You can see the same colors here in Pooja Bahari's work. That is, there are certain Indian colors, you know, that are entrenched in you because they come from our landscape and not anybody else's. The other thing that the Indian landscape has is people. The European landscape doesn't have people because there are not so many people around. I remember walking through miles and miles of moor in Ireland without meeting a human being. And then when you meet a human being, you wish them because you've seen a human being. In India, you can't go five feet from here to there without encountering somebody. So that comes out in the Indian landscape. So this is Western outlook on landscape imbibed in the Indian context with Indian colors and Indian feeling. Coming back to landscapes, this again is a landscape, but yes. of a very different kind. Exactly. Here you find that this is a landscape that goes back into our erotic tradition. Yes. What is called the erotic tradition by the West, because for us, uh, Khajuraho was no more erotic than the other temples which don't have uh, sculptures depicting uh, sexual activity. So in India, the erotic and non-erotic are part of the same thing. So here you have something as bland as a landscape full of erotic references. So you can see this is an Indian non-figurative work with a narrative that goes back to our erotic tradition according to the West, but which goes back to life according to us. Shivlal, who is a young uh, artist uh, of the 90s and is an award winner. Uh, national award winner. He's going to be having a show soon, right? He's going to be having a show in Bombay. Okay. You see, uh, I find that our tradition in sculpture also mm. shares a lot with the classical tradition of sculpture. Mm. If you see the uh, Grecian marbles and reliefs, you'll see the element of flow 
as an essential part of sculpture. And here also, you can see that these bolts give you an element of flow right through. And they give you, they trap an element of space in them. And the sequence, you can see, goes on to very hard steel wire which then you can pick up in the element of flow that is a part of the uh, the uh, how can we say it? the element of flow that is a part of the uh, that is a part of that rosary which is a part of our uh, you know um, not just religious tradition I would say it's a part of our spiritual tradition. Mm. So this element of flow has come in from our actual creation of narrative works into a tradition of spiritual uh, repetition. But each word repeated is not the same. If you look at the works of uh, Yusuf Arakal, you will see ten heads or nine heads, but each head is different. What he's trying to tell you is that each repetition in life, both in the scale of time and in the scale of life, is different. What I was yesterday, I am not today. So this element, again, is a very powerful element which comes into the tree of life concept, which you can see here with Bimandas. And this tree of life concept shows you that each human being is part of a contribution to a far greater edifice than himself or herself, which is an essential part of our art and our spiritual thinking. Thank you so much, Sunita. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs>